Hello there, everyone. Um, I'm Corrine Wallach. I am the community manager for developer relations team at Neo4j. And I am here with my colleague, Mark Needham, uh, who is also one of our developer relations engineers. And another one of my colleagues, Andy Jefferson, uh, who is our presenter today, who will be talking about deep learning on graphs. Um, so Andy, I will let you introduce yourself, if you would like. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I'm a, a software engineer at Neo4j, and I also work as a researcher at, at an organization called Octavian. Uh, and so I'm gonna talk about the research that I do at Octavian uh, on knowledge graphs. Yeah, so let me let me just quickly and just do a little bit of housekeeping before you get you get started then, Andy. So um, if you have any questions uh, while Andy's presenting, uh, feel free to ask those on the, the YouTube chat that we've got on the right hand side. Um, sometimes YouTube doesn't put your resolution at the proper thing, uh, proper proper resolution. So on your bottom right hand side of your control panel, there's a little cog with the HD icon on it, set that to at least 720p, and you will be able to see everything uh, more clearly. Uh, other than that, I'll, I'll hand back to uh, Andy for the- I talk. do want to also add, if any of one out there, if you're interested in sharing on one of our online meetups in the future, you can go to our community site and post your project under projects or content if it's like a blog post, and uh, that's where we're going to be selecting our future talks. So you can also vote there for things that you want to see in the future. Awesome. OK, I hope you I hope you guys can see the screen. Yeah, we're all good. Awesome. Cool. So I'm going to talk about Graph AI. Um, I've already introduced myself a bit, but just to make this uh, super clear, uh, I'm an engineer on the cloud team at Neo4j. We're building uh, Neo4j software as a service in the cloud. That's a pretty exciting thing that's coming up. Uh, but today I'm talking about the research that I do on artificial intelligence at, at Octavian. Uh, Octavian is an open source research organization. So, but um, if you're not, graph is that we have these nodes. Uh, we have these nodes which are connected by edges. Um, and in Neo4j, we have this property graph model. So in the property graph model, both nodes and edges can have properties. So a node like employee can have properties like name, date of birth, uh, ID number, maybe country of residence. Uh, and then relationships can have properties as well as having a relationship type. So here we've got two different types of relationship, like location and CEO. So the image below is the graph model that DeepMind used in a recent research paper. And the reason I've pulled that out is to show that these two models are the same thing. In a more mathematical formalism, but you've got the same information. There are nodes connected by relationships, and both the nodes and the relationships have properties. In the DeepMind model, these are called attributes, and they're often thought of as vectors, but the models are the same and we can transform between the two of them. So that's that's all we're concerned with are these graphs. And graphs are really powerful at expressing all kinds of different uh, knowledge, information, and data. So why are we interested in these graphs? Well, like I said, they're really powerful uh, and we can use them to re Research has been around as a concept uh, since uh, Leonard Euler, who's the guy in the top left here. Uh, and he is famous for the seven, well, he's famous within graph theory for the seven bridges of Konigsberg Berg problem, uh, which is the first kind of recorded uh, mathematical graph problem or graph proof. Um, but here I've got some other examples of graphs uh, that we think about. In the top right, there's a semantic graph where we're mapping out a kind of idealized set of relationships that we can use to describe the world. Um, in the bottom left, I've got more of a, a kind of database graph. Um, so we've got lots of information about different instances of customers, products, interacting with each other, 
and to keep track of things like just how many customers do we have? And in the bottom right, uh, I've got a transit network graph. Um, anyone who's lived in a city is probably familiar with that. And so each of these representations is useful to us in a different way, uh, but they're all graphs and they're all made up of nodes and edges. So we're interested in graphs because graphs are everywhere. We can represent lots of knowledge with graphs. And if we know how to manipulate graphs cleverly, then we can understand and interact with all of that knowledge. The question is, what is AI? I'm not going to try and answer that because I don't know the answer. Um, what I am going to talk about is what is deep learning? So deep learning has uh, this as its building block. If this was interactive, I'd ask uh, how many people have seen this before. But typically when I ask that question, it's about 50% of people in the audience I present to. Um, and what this is, this is is the densely connected layers uh, in a neural network. So in this neural network, each layer, each no, each item in each layer is fully connected to all of the items in the previous layer. We've got two hidden layers, uh, and that's where the deep comes from. So when we talk about deep neural networks, the depth is the number of layers in the neural network. Um, and these fully connected layers, where the, through machine learning and gradient descent, we learn the parameters of how nodes in one layer interact with nodes in the next layer uh, is the building block of a whole range of uh, AI innovations that have come around recently. But the, the fundamental building block are these neural networks, usually using densely connected layers. So what have they been used for? Um, this AlphaGo is probably the most famous application of deep learning. Uh, and AlphaGo used deep reinforcement learning uh, to train a computer to or to learn to play Go better than some of the best Go players in the world. And uh, so this is a great example of uh, AI outperforming humans using deep learning. Um, but there are a few others that we can look at as well. So here are some from the world of image recognition. Um, on the left, there's uh, something, there's a neural network called MacNet, uh, which I'm a massive fan of. And it, this shows multi-step reasoning from a neural network at the same time as doing image processing. Um, on the left, we've got the question that was asked. So this, this is combining image recognition, at natural language processing, and multi-step reasoning, which is really awesome. So the question this was asked was, what color is the matte thing to the right of the sphere in front of the tiny blue block? And in the central column, we can see which of the words the uh, machine, the neural network was focusing on in each stage of reasoning towards getting to the answer. And on the right, we can see which parts of the image the AI was focusing on in each of those reasoning steps as it got towards the answer. So it starts to find the sphere. And then finally, it picks out the cylinder, which is the answer to the question. Um, so this is really awesome. And that's something that's inspired a lot of our work. On the right-hand side, you've got some really complex problems. Um, the top right one is uh, image classification problem, but it's classifying multiple parts in the same image. And in the bottom right, we've got a problem where the AI is predicting where a car is most likely to go. So that's doing path prediction, but from a still image. So this has learned about cars, that cars tend to go forward, trees and they tend to drive along roads um, and that's a like really sophisticated piece of AI and all of these the AI is performing as well as or better than humans on the task. So we want to bring this superhuman performing AI and we want to apply it to the world of graphs which we use to represent all kinds of information from the stock in our store to how we travel around big cities. Before we get to that let's take a step back and think what is machine learning? What does the machine learning process and interface look like? So in machine learning, what we generate is a trained model. Uh, can learn how, how to understand some data. And then we train it by giving it lots and lots of examples of data. And from that, it learns a set of parameters 
uh, which allow it to predict from the data some outcomes. When we've trained a model, there's basically two things that we can do with that model. We can look at the parameters or the weights that it has learned, or we can just use it to make predictions. Sometimes we do one or the other, sometimes we do both. To make this a bit more concrete, we can just think about linear regression within this framework. The linear regression, our model is y is mx plus c. And hopefully most of you are familiar with that model. In this model, the parameters or weights that we learn are m and c. And the training data that we use to train the model is a list of x and y values. So x is the, the input value and y is the output that we're predicting. And we train it with loads of those values. And then if we want to figure out what y is for a given x, we can plug it into the model with the parameters that we've learned. Sometimes in something like physics, you actually is and less about the predictive nature of the model. Uh, other times, we care much more about the predictive nature of the model and not at all about the parameters. The same approach applies to classifiers like neural network classifiers, like the image classifiers uh, that I showed before. We train them in exactly the same way. We have a model, which is a neural network. That model takes a whole load of parameters. So here, W, which is the parameter of our model, is actually a matrix of maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands uh, of values. Is and the category of those images. So the training data could be uh, ImageNet, for example, which is list, which is a whole collection of pictures, and for each picture, a classification. It says, you know, this is a picture of a dog, this is a picture of a cat, this is a picture of a car, and so on. And we take those hundreds of thousands of images and we train the model and it learns a whole set of weights and those weights enable the neural network to classify the image. Another example um, of machine learning is on natural language. And this is an example where we use the weights rather than the predictive power is when we generate a word embedding. Uh, so that would be something like word to vec word to vec is a model uh, which converts essentially words, a whole dictionary of words, into vectors. Those vectors are then used for further steps in different kind of machine learning or predictive processes. And the way that's trained is by predicting a probability that certain words will be uh, will appear in the context that surrounds a given word. Um, and we train a neural network to predict that. But with this training, we don't actually care about the ability to predict what words will appear in the same sentence as a particular word. What we care about is the resulting word embedding, which is a trained weight that we get out, and the fact that that word embedding has this property that similar words have similar embeddings. So is what is deep learning? And what deep learning is, is machine learning, training the models with data, and uses gradient descent. Don't worry if uh, you're not entirely following all of that. Um, so long as you understand this is the high level view of the thing we're trying to do, that's fine. So how do we take this deep learning and apply it to graphs? This is probably the scariest slide in the whole presentation. Uh, but what we tried to do at Octavian was having taken that step back to understand like what does this, what is the pattern of machine learning, we then said, how would we like machine learning on graphs to work? So we thought about image classifiers and the way they work is they learn to predict a probability that an image belongs to a category, right? Is it a horse, a dog, a cat, a car? So it lets us predict the probability for each category given an input image. And it does that by applying a convolutional neural network to the image. So that's great. What we want to do with the graph is perhaps take a section of the graph, a subgraph, and predict some category that it belongs to. Or perhaps we want to predict class belonging to a node based on the subgraph around that node. Um, so an example prediction we might want to make is. Uh, are you going? What way are you going to vote? Are you going to vote Republican or are you going to vote Democrat? And we might base 
to hop or two hops. Okay. Now we don't want to do that because uh, we don't want to subvert democracy, but that's an example of a predictive graph algorithm. So we went through and we said we want to make uh, we want to research how we can make uh, machine learning apply to graphs and apply to subgraphs, and we want to be training it on subgraphs or nodes from graphs and predicting outcomes, you know, regression, classification, or embedding based on those. So that was our goal. Now, there are some existing mechanisms that you can use on a graph, uh, such as node to vec, which we didn't like because they didn't fit into this pattern. Um, so the way that node to vec works, for example, is it takes random paths, random walks from within the graph, and then it uses those with a neural network um, as the training data. And the reason we didn't like that was because each item of training data is just a random walk in the graph. Thing is you're throwing away graph structure and graph information in order to convert from a complicated subgraph into a simple sequence, a random walk, and you're throwing away data so that you can fit into the training model that you have. So the training model can only cope with sequences because it's adapted from natural language processing. And so we're throwing away graph data in order to suit our neural network model. And we didn't want to do that. We wanted to keep all the graph information and find some way of adapting neural network to be able to deal with that graph information. So we had a kind of goal, but obviously we're not the only people doing that. So we took a look um, and we took a look at what's already going on in the world of deep learning with graphs. Uh, and there's a reasonable amount of stuff out there. So these are a couple of examples of results from uh, research on using neural networks on graphs. One of the things I want to pull out from here is just the fact that these aren't achieving the superhuman performance uh, that we can get with deep learning on things like images or playing Go. So the results uh, on the left here um, are looking at DeepGL, which is a graph uh, embedding approach, and NodeToVec, which is another graph embedding approach. And DeepGL is best performing better than NodeToVec. But you can see that the success rate it's getting is 87% at best. And really, there's a lot here that are below 80%. And that means below 80% means it's getting it wrong more than one in five times. And we're really looking for stuff that's going to achieve a higher success rate than that. Um, similarly, on the right hand side with classification tasks, you can see there are things that are achieving 50 or 60 percent. Uh, and on the bottom right, there's a task which is to do with predicting chemical reactions. Um, the pre chemical reaction prediction task is really interesting because it deals with lots and lots of small subgraphs compared with looking at things like Reddit, which is analyzing one really massive graph. Um, but still on the chemical prediction, when it's saying, when looking at the first prediction, like the top prediction from the neural network, the success rates are 70%, 78%. So we thought that there was some, some scope to improve this. So the challenge that a lot of these existing mechanisms uh, take on is how we take a complicated and variable structure like a graph and fit it into a fixed size matrix in order to apply existing neural network techniques. So most existing neural matrix, a predetermined size of matrix. Um, and from that, it's able to make, process it and make a prediction. Um, but with a graph, if you say, I want to look at a person and I want to look at their friends, um, or if I'm dealing with a transit station, transit network, and I say I've got a graph uh, and I want to look at all of the places that I can get to that are within five stops of the station that I'm at, depending on where you are, the, the size and shape of your data could be radically different. You might only have 10 friends or you might have a thousand friends. So going from the graph into a fixed size matrix is, is a technical mathematical challenge and a lot of these approaches try to solve that and one example of how they solve that is by taking random walks in the graph but this after doing more research this turns out to be a bit of a red herring so 
thinking about how neural networks work, um, a lot of people say that neural networks are good for unstructured data. But actually, the way that they work and the things they're successful on are tied to very specific data structures. So neural networks are great at classifying images, as I talked about, and doing all kinds of image processing tasks. And they're really good at dealing with sequences. So natural language tasks are almost always approached as sequences. So they take a sequence of words, sometimes even a sequence of letters in a word. Um, sometimes they process the sequence bidirectionally, but they're always dealing with sequences for natural language and these image grids for images. And the property that these have is that we already know in advance how uh, individual data points are related to each other or individual positions within the input matrix. So in a sequence, the item that comes before something and the item that comes after are more relevant than an item that's far away in the sequence. With an image, we know that pixels that are adjacent to each other or close to each other are more relevant than pixels that are far away to each other. And the, net, the structures that the neural networks use to be successful with these represent that data. So taking a, taking a view of the Go board, the Go model is able to use a dense neural network because every location on the board is equally relevant to every other location. Because of the way that Go is played, you can play a tile uh, in one corner of the board and that can have an effect on a position at another corner of the board. So using a dense network makes sense for that because there's a equal likelihood that any position on the board might have an important impact on any other position on the board. But like I was saying, that's not true for images and sequences. And as it happens, the most successful models for images and sequences don't use dense neural networks. So for images, we actually use convolutional neural networks. And a convolutional network builds in this property that adjacent pixels are more important than far away pixels. So instead of connecting every single pixel in the input and adding it or mixing it in some way with every other pixel in the input to produce an output, or pixels, and we combine those together to make a pixel in the intermediate layer. Andrew, and then I think we you cut out. I think you cut out a little bit. Can you repeat what you just said? I think you cut out. So I just want to make sure everybody can hear you. Yeah, sure. Cool. Um, it just recapping that for Karen. Um, in convolutional neural network, what we do is we use a convolution kernel, and that convolution kernel only looks at image at pixels that are close to the particular pixel we're concerned with, and then connects those together it doesn't take into account the values of pixels that are far away. Um, and so we don't actually use these dense neural networks. Uh, with images, we use these convolutional neural networks. And they've built in that expectation that pixels that are adjacent to, by analogy, we do a similar thing with recurrent neural networks for dealing with sequences, in that a recurrent neural network makes the item that comes before me in the list much more relevant than items that are far apart. Um, so based on this, how should we be thinking about graphs? If we look at the graph and the dense neural network, uh, it should be obvious that the dense network isn't encompassing the properties of the graph. What we like would like is the things that are close to each other in the graph to have more of an effect on one another than things that are far apart in the graph. But that's not something that's built in to a dense network. So we don't expect, or we shouldn't expect, it should work out with a model, a neural network model uh, that can, maintains the priors of the graph, maintains this property that things that are close to each other have more influence on each other than things that are far apart. The challenge with graphs is that they're really variable in structure. Right, so images and sequences have the exact same structure every time, um, but a graph is going to have a different structure or a variable structure, uh, even if it's got a fixed schema. So the challenge with AI is not just how do we turn 
a graph into a vector so that we can put it through dense neural networks. It's how do we come up with a neural network architecture that can understand graphs more effectively. All these semantic or knowledge graphs as it is to um, more database graphs. So, biases. Um, and to, to put it in a phrase is how can we structure the neural network to retain graph structural priors? So I'm not the only person, uh, and we at Octave are not the only people thinking about this. My ideas are for this uh, recent paper. Uh, a lot of this we were working on before this paper came out, and then when we read this paper, we're just like, wow, these guys, um, they are, they've had all the same thoughts as the rest of it much better than we ever could. So I'd encourage inductive biases, deep learning and graph networks uh, from DeepMind, GT and the University of Edinburgh. So that, that paper is a lot of work to read. Uh, I think I read it about five or six times and I'm still getting stuff out of it. But I wanted to pull something out of it for you guys. So one of the things that that paper expresses is this model for graph processing. And these are the only equations, by the way, in this uh, presentation other than y equals mx plus c. So it's, it doesn't get any harder than this. <laughs> and it's going to get easier. They propose this algorithm for processing a graph. The first step, the edge update, is that every edge is updated based on the nodes that it's connected to and the global state. The second step in the algorithm is we update every node based on the values of the edges that are connected to it. And then the final state is we take the whole graph, all the nodes and all the edges, and we update the global state. And to do this, we define six functions. Um, one function for transforming the edge, and one function for aggregating all of the things attached to the edges, one function for transforming the node, and one function for aggregating um, the nodes, and so a function for aggregating all the last step. And with these six functions and this algorithm, uh, that paper proposes that we can uh, implement lots of different existing graph algorithms. Uh, and that they don't have to be anything involving neural networks. They can be algorithms uh, like PageRank uh, or e breadth first search. Um, they just propose this as a framework for doing a graph computation. But they go on to say, if we were to make these functions neural networks, or just some of them can be neural networks and some of them can be a kind of identity function, um, then we can train those functions uh, using gradient descent to a fully trainable mechanism and that learns the functions necessary to transform the graph towards some goal. To put this hopefully a the idea they're proposing is that we load the specific graph that we're dealing with uh, into memory, and then we use some collection of neural network functions that are able to learn to transform that graph in memory. And then eventually, we get some output that is reading information from a transformed. That's, that's the approach Andrew, that we think we should do. We might have to yeah. have you repeat that one set of piece again, because I think the internet was cutting out again. OK, sorry about that. Um, a simpler way to look at this is what we're proposing that you do is you take a graph and you load it into memory uh, inside some application where we can then transform that graph in a series of steps. And each of those transformations is being carried out by some neural network or combination of neural network functions um, that are end-to-end -end trainable. And then eventually, Um, and this can be thought of in this graph memory network setting. So we're not transforming the graph into a vector and putting it through some process, but we're actually interactively updating the graph 
um, with a collection of neural network functions. So that's the approach that um, we think is suited to the structural prize of graphs. And it's the approach that DeepMind has proposed in that paper. Uh, the question is, you know, from our experience, does it work? So with which to train and test whether it works. So we built this data set called Clever Graph. It's inspired by the data set that's used uh, for the image training and reasoning process that I showed earlier on, where we were looking at, you know, what is the color of the sphere to the left of the gray cube or whatever it was. That task comes from a data set called Clever. We were inspired by that to create a data set that was graph based rather than image based, and we called it Clever Graph. What Clever Graph consists of is 10,000 uh, data points. Uh, each of those is a question, answer, and a graph. So, and each of these graphs is unique. And we modeled it on transport networks, uh, roughly based on the London Underground Transport Network, but each graph is different and synthetically generated. Um, and each of those synthetically generated graphs is effectively unique. It has different stations, different lines, different uh, organization of those stations and lines. And each, the questions are sampled, um, there are about 20 types, and for each question type, there are some different wordings, which we generated with a computer, and then there are these different answers. So on this data set, uh, we hope to be able to take these unique graphs and answer questions about them. And it's really important to understand that we're not training the graph to memorize we're not training the neural network to memorize answers on a specific graph. We're actually training it to deal with dynamic graphs that it's never seen before uh, and figure out the answer given that the schema is fixed. So here's an example of uh, one of the graph networks that's generated by the Clever Graph. So you can see this is the kind of section from the transport graph. Example of the questions uh, that are included. Uh, particularly interesting questions for me in here um, are, for example, uh, questions. Oh, Andrew, Andrew cut, that, out, it cut out a bit when you were, you were Andrew, cut out a bit when you were explaining which questions were interesting. We might have to repeat that bit again. Um, yeah, so there's within these questions that I find interesting, um, the station adjacency, so are like a kind of architecture station is adjacent to station. They require potentially multiple steps of reasoning um, to see if to if to find which station is adjacent to the station given a particular property requires looking at multiple nodes attached to a given node and looking at their properties. Um, whether there is a station that exists at all was also quite an interesting question. So is there a station called Oxford Circus? Because um, it might not exist in a particular one. And that that question is very interesting because a lot of neural networks don't, uh, neural network problems don't deal with the case where their answer doesn't exist. Um, so for example, when you do image classification, uh, typically, every image contains something that you can classify. Yeah. Train with images of just white noise or empty space. Um, but anyway, these these questions require a mixture of different uh, skills from our uh, graph reasoning engine. Those skills include counting nodes, counting edges, reading properties from nodes, and these multi-step uh, reasoning that require you to transfer, traverse a graph, find the shortest path between two nodes, uh, or to combine facts, combine or compare data in the graph. So this is how we're doing uh, with our architecture training on and testing against Clever Graph. You can see we're able to get, because it's synthetic data, we're able to get virtually 100% um, on these questions once we have achieved the right architecture. So here, what we've done is we've separated them out into um, questions that require different skills. 
the first set, um, the skills just require looking up properties on nodes. Then we move on to things that are more complex. So the next one, station adjacency, requires looking at both nodes and edges. Then we need to look at nodes, their properties and edges. Then we get on to things like um, how many stations are between one station and another station. That requires the network to learn how to do Dijkstra's algorithm, right? Finding the shortest path between two points. Um, and you can see we're still getting 98% accuracy uh, on those. With Dijkstra's algorithm, we're getting 98% accuracy on stations that are up to nine uh, hops apart. Um, the, there's also the existence questions that I talked about, and they're challenging for different reasons. And then you can see there are these questions that we haven't yet tested the network on. So this is a work in progress. Um, but each time we look at this and we work on another set of questions, we're maintaining the performance on the previous questions and adding uh, more abilities to our graph. Uh, to our so does it work? Uh, I hope I've shown that we're able to achieve a pretty good level of success on a range of different problems. And I'm finding this end to end. So the neural network gets as its input the English language text and the unique graph. And these training results are on graphs that the network hasn't been trained on. So it's never seen those graphs before. It just has been trained on the schema of those graphs. The fact there are stations, they have a particular set of properties. There are edges that have particular properties and those connect those stations. So we're really confident that this approach is showing uh, much better results than a lot of the previous deep learning on graph approaches, uh, but we don't have the full set yet to show you. So does it work? Um, promising, but I can't say for sure. But let's talk a little bit about how it works. So I reckon I've got about eight minutes. Um, and that should be about right. So the questions we've got to recap, we've got a graph, we've got an English language question, and then we've got an answer, uh, which is either a number or it's one of the stations or lines in the graph. The graph network algorithm gave us a method for propagating information through and transforming a graph, which is great. But we have to also bring into a bring our question into the equation. We have to prime the graph to answer our specific query. If, because we could have the same graph, uh, but different question. All right, so I might, instead of saying how many stations are between Bank and Temple, I might say, is there a station called Oxford Circuit? Or I might ask, what is, you know, is there a rail connection um, at Bank? So we have to take the graph and we have to prime it or somehow prime the neural network to answer that question. So DeepMind gave us a, a big like boost in how we can structure a neural network to retain graph priors, but it ha hasn't helped us um, figuring out how to prime graphs to answer questions, which is the task we've set ourselves. So we took a look at uh, other research and this paper uh, really stands out and really is the foundation of a lot of, a lot of work in um, deep learning at the moment. And this introduced this new cell called the attention cell, and that has a big impact, for example, on the network used for the Mac image uh, research that I showed, the MacNet image reasoning that I showed earlier. So this introduced this attention cell, uh, which is a fundamentally different building block for a neural network from the deep layers. Uh, and we we can use this to solve that problem of how do we prime the graph and also to solve the problem of how do we read out from a graph. So the way the attention cell works is it allows us to, to take a query and then to take a list, a potentially variable size list of elements and score each of those elements against that query. So these embedded question tokens uh, in this case, it's the tokens of the words of the question, um, but it can also be a list of nodes, it could be a list of edges, or it could be a list of edges and nodes. And we take uh, the query and we score it against each of those items. And then we use the softmax um, to transform that those scores into a probability distribution. 
and then we weight the input items by the, the score that they get after that normalization with softmax and then we aggregate them all together and the output a fixed size control signal so what one benefit of this is it allows us to take a variable length list like a list of nodes or a list of edges and convert it into a fixed size signal and attention has really um, been used to make some groundbreaking improvements in things like uh, natural language processing and word embedding uh, as well as uh, multi-step reasoning and understanding for example what the graph is looking at by looking at these scores we're able to generate those images that i showed earlier that show you what the neural network appeared to be looking at so we're going to use these attention cells and the way that we use them with a graph is that we use them to write a signal into the graph based off of the query that we were given so the query is like what are uh, how many stops are there between temple and bank and that query then is used with an attention cell which is looking at every single node in the graph uh, this could be every single node and every single edge or it can just be every edge uh, but in our implementation we just look at the nodes and basing based on the score for each node with respect to the query we wait we give a weighted input signal onto that node so if we were asking a question about temple and bank clearly those stations would be more relevant to that question than stations that didn't have those names uh, and we wouldn't expect them to get the same uh, input from this attention so we use this approach to get a signal into the graph to prime it and make it care about the question that we're dealing with and then what we can do is we can propagate the information through the graph with message passing and then the challenge we have is how do we read the answer out of the graph so the node that is the answer to the question or pull out the number um, that is the answer to the question or the name of a station whatever it is and we can use attention for that as well and um, so we use attention to read out of the graph by taking the query again and trying to figure out which node in the graph contains the information that's relevant to answering the query so we put all of that together, and this is the architect called Mac Graph. Um, there's Andrew, you cut out just right when you were saying uh, that this is called Mac Graph. If you can repeat yourself again. Yeah. So uh, we call this Mac Graph, and um, this is the really high-level view of the architecture. And there's a lot more information available in, in our GitHub repository. Like I said, all of our work is open source. Um, but from you know, 20,000 feet, we're using attention to send a signal into the graph. Message passing to let the graph evolve using functions, neural network functions that learn over time how they're supposed to operate. And then we're using attention to read information out of the graph again. And that's the architecture that we're using to get those results on that range of uh, question and answer tasks on unseen graphs. So what we've been able to achieve is a model that we can train, neural network model we can train uh, with gradient descent that learns how to navigate a particular graph schema. And with that graph schema, learn multiple algorithms to answer multiple different questions. And we're doing it with end-to-end -end training. So we're training it on what we want to be able to do, the exact task. And that training looks like, you know, question, answer, and the graph that we want you to deal with. And we've shown that we can take a single model and architecture, and it's able to learn uh, a range of different graph algorithms to solve different problems, right? We've got Dijkstra's algorithm, we've got reading properties of nodes, and we've got looking, we've got breadth first search at uh, finding you know who's adjacent with a given property and we think that that's that's really promising and there's a lot more already we've shown that this approach can definitely learn graph specific algorithms and yeah we hope to continue researching this and using the, the approach that we've done which is building synthetic data sets and using those synthetic data sets 
um, to understand neural network and how it works and to improve the performance on tasks that we should be able to, to win. Um, so that's, that's where we are today at Octavian. Um, and I invite anyone who's interested to come and participate. You know, you can email us, you can tweet us, and you can check out our repos on GitHub. Uh, and we're always interested to get more people involved in this research um, and to find new problems uh, that we think we might be able to apply it to. So with that, I'll hand it over to Mark, I think, for well, yes. any questions. We do have some questions uh, that came in. Mark Kristoff asked if there's any recommended learning resources to help someone better understand the material. Um, and uh, we did, uh, David um, Mack did already respond in the uh, chat saying about the Octavian blog and the deep learning book. But if you have any other suggestions there, or maybe on like one of some of your journey of exploration. Yeah, um, so switch. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, <laughs> reading the um, reading some of those articles is really great. Uh, particularly, you know, I'm a big fan of that DeepMind paper. Um, there's a thing called Graph Sage and a network group at Stanford who have some really good articles and papers. Um, that's that's really how a lot of my journey has come through, uh, as well as reading that material giving yourself really simple problems to do can you know can you just train something that can take a list of numbers for example and pick a number out of that list using attention you can build very simple problems and apply these same techniques to them nice okay uh we also have another question from victor lee he asked he said so in general in the general computational model in each iteration, every edge and every vertex is getting updated, question mark. Is that really practical on the O4J? Uh, so that's that's how the model works, is that we transform the whole graph multiple times. Um, we're not using Neo4j to do that. Uh, we're doing that in memory time using TensorFlow. Um, whether or not it's practical to use Neo4j, if we were running inside the JVM, then I think it would be practical. Out, so if we're running inside Neo4j, my belief is it would be. From outside of Neo4j, it may be a little harder, um, but it depends on the speed and parallelism that we can support. So potentially these are super parallel algorithms. Oh, you cut out a little bit towards the end. Um, potentially these are really parallelizable, so you're just sending a lot of updates. Um, you know, concurrent updates into the graph and concurrent reads, and that's not a like that's a workload that isn't that challenging for Neo4j. Awesome. Um, so uh, if anybody has any other questions after this Hangouts is over, you can ask in our Neo4j community site. Um, there is a link to it in the description of the YouTube. Um, you're also able to post there if you have uh, an idea of something that you want to talk about for the next online meetups um, under projects or content categories, if, you know, if it's projects. And you can put it under a project category. And um, also, is there anything else, Andrew, that you want to mention before if, so people can, you know, aside from the Octavian blog, if you have anything else that might be good or? No, I mean, aside from the Neo4j community and the Octavian blog, uh, those are great places to ask questions. Mm -hmm. We do have another question that came in that's interesting. Uh, yeah. Robert Shimizu, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. He asked if you're using Neo4j to train, uh, to model and train the model. And Atul, Atul uh, asked how multiple Drawing levels of, I mean, do you actually see the chat? Because you might actually see these questions too. So maybe there's something in here that you would be interested in. Um, uh, I don't think I see the chat or I see okay. the chat. But uh, yeah, so we're not using Neo4j to train. Um, this, you know, the stuff we're doing, we are experimenting with altering and adjusting neural networks um, and changing all kinds of uh, aspects of that. And so we're working in, in memory in TensorFlow, uh, but we do use Neo4j for storing and sharing and transforming graphs. Um, and we hope, you know to be able to bring a synergy of the two when we're not working on synthetic problems so if we're working on real world data that's 
transactional and being stored and has some importance, then I expect that we're going to need to deal with databases much more. Um, a lot of people are saying that they really like the talk. If everybody watching, if you really enjoyed Andy's talk, please put a thumbs up on the talk. Um, and we do have some other questions. Somebody, Santiago Gonzalez asked, have you applied the techniques you explained here to compute subgraph similarities? Can you say that again, Karen? Uh, he said, have you applied the techniques you explained here to compute subgraph similarities? Okay, I think the I think the sound yeah. cut out a little bit. So if if you I'll heard, if did you hear me? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I think, can, I'll see if I can find the chat and um and reply in text. But yeah, I think the internet okay. gods are. Yeah, I mean, if anybody has again, if anybody has any other questions that you want to ask, you can definitely go to our community site. Andy actually posted a thread, and you can talk directly to him. Um, you can ask questions there, and it'll be good and valuable for other people, and even after the fact. Um, we also have a talk next week on Wednesday, November 21st, at the same time as this one, um, that's going to be on uh, similarity graph algorithms. Um, so that should be an interesting one. Um, yeah, so I think that that, I think we can probably call it a end of show. Um, thank you so much, Andy, for taking the time out and showing us this. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys next week. You're welcome. See ya. Bye.